Scripture reading today is in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 24. Be joyful always. Pray constantly. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecy with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who called you is faithful, and he will do it. So be it. Thank you, Merle. So, before I start, a couple announcements. Thursday, mark your calendars if you are on the budget committee and if you're on nominating committee. Five o'clock, we're going to have a budget meeting. I know it's last minute, but I'm finally, I got two people to ask questions and I'll have these talent surveys, spiritual gift commitment forms finished finally. So, we've got a budget meeting at five o'clock. And then we're going to follow that with a nominating meety, meety, meeting at 6 o'clock. If you're not sure if you're on nominating committee, then I will come tell you that you are or not. If you can't come, don't worry. I know it's last minute. And then I'm thinking that we do our board meeting next Sunday if everybody's in agreement. Okay? If you're not, let me know and I'll tell everybody. Sorry, last minute, but I finally got everything done. Now let me give you one other update on what's been going on also. Because if you've noticed it's a little brighter in here, it's because there's all new lights in here. And there haven't been lights over here just to say that, because somebody said, hey, that light's out. It's been out. <laughs> but the reason you notice it is because it's much brighter in here. The reason those lights aren't there is for the projectors, of course. So this month we've had some expenses that are out of the normal, because we have light bulbs, we have the insulation now in the attic, and if you go up in the attic, instead of it being 120 degrees up there or even more, it's nice and comfortable because there's insulation in there. Um, we also have a pocket door downstairs that we've got. So we had all those bills come up this month. So if you feel led to give at all, make sure you give in January so we can cover all these expenses. Otherwise, we do have the money, but it would come out of the building fund. It'd be so nice to have all that money come out of our regular operating fund than rather have to dip into the building fund. reason I'm saying that is because we still have the back of this uh, wall here to update. The steeple needs some repairs. The shingles for the roofing are going to need to be replaced. We're going to be spending some money on the church. So if you can give, give. And if we can have it come out of our normal operating budget for this month, which the bills that came in were over $3,000, just so you know a figure, then it would be wonderful to be able to pay that just straight out of our normal operating expenses. So now let's pray and let's listen to God, what He speaks in His Word. Father in heaven, we thank You so much because You are a gracious, loving God that you would send your Son, Jesus Christ, the one promised in the Old Testament, the Messiah, the Anointed One of God, that He would humbly come to this earth and give up everything, far beyond what we could ever imagine, that He would give up and come as the very thing that He created, to live a life that's an example for us, a life that was selfish, selfless instead of selfish, a life that was giving to others, a life that gave His own life to save us. Father, we thank You for that. We thank You that the cross does have the final word, that death was defeated once and for all, that Satan has no power and dominion in our lives, that we are children of the Most High, brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ, and we thank You for that. And Father, I also pray today that we will give our hearts and our lives to You, because our life is not our own, but it was bought with the precious, precious price of Jesus Christ's blood at Calvary. And we thank you and praise you for that. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you notice, the scripture from 1 Thessalonians was just kind of a good list there of how we should live. You might want to mark that. You might want to look at it later and just see. But it's, it's the way that we should live as Christians, as brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to talk about Thessalonians so much. I'm going to go back to Colossians since we looked there the other day, but not go that deep into it. The title of this sermon I, t- I entitled Faithful Brothers and Sisters because that's how Paul writes in the NLT. Your version may say a little different. That's how he addressed these believers at Colossae when he wrote this letter. <clears throat> the church at Thessalonica was a letter that Paul also wrote and it was a very encouraging letter also. They were living the way that they should live in spite of all the persecution and everything. Think about that. That was not a good time to be a Christian, to follow after the way of Jesus Christ, to give up your life to serve your master. That's what the church was, the way the church started, the way the church still should be today. So the fact that we can come and worship and we can call ourselves Christians in a non-persecuted environment, and I say non-persecuted, because how are you persecuted? Somebody at work says, ha ha, he's a Christian. You have to give up some of your time to, to do things that God calls you to do. That's not persecution, not even remotely. And where people are persecuted in the world today because they proclaim Jesus Christ, then their faith is strong. And we're going to talk about that, about faithful brothers and sisters. Two weeks ago, my emphasis was on 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 3, where Paul writes, Dear brothers and sisters, we can't help but thank God for you because your faith is flourishing and your love for one another is growing. Those two things are what set the tone for that letter. The individuals that were meeting there, he thanked them for their faith because it was flourishing. That means blooming, budding, growing, doing exactly what it's supposed to do, producing fruit, which meant that people were coming and adding to their numbers in spite of any persecution or ridicule. And their love for one another was growing as a result. Sum up what Jesus said when he summed up the Ten Commandments. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. And to love your neighbor as yourself. I don't know about you, but I love myself. So that puts a big thing out there for me to love others. Because when I do sit there and think about myself, oh yeah, there's many times where I get my feelings hurt or whatever because I didn't get my way. The more I examine myself, the more I, yeah, I'm a selfish person that loves myself. And the more I have to get down on my knees and lay it down at the cross so that I can put him on the throne rather than myself. It's a daily dying, a daily denying so that I can follow Christ. Those are the testimonies of the churches of that day. The church that we should be like. Paul goes on to, to write 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 4 through 7. We know, dear brothers and sisters, that God loves you and has chosen you to be his own people. For when we brought you the good news, it was not only with words, but also with power. So if you aren't living the life that you're supposed to live as a Christian, as a like Christ or little Christ, as a believer, as a disciple, whatever words you want to put in there, then you're denying the power of God that lives inside of you. If, in fact, the power of God resides inside of you. You know what a slap in the face that is to God? He gave His one and only Son to die for you. And if you're not latching on to that power, what are you saying back to God? He said, I don't worry about the sacrifices anymore. You you are a royal priest and everything. You're going to go present me. People don't have to come to a high priest where I've come down the temple. I reside inside of you by the Spirit of God. So does your light shine before others. Verse 5, For when we brought you the good news, it was not only with words, but also with power. For the Holy Spirit gave you full assurance 
of what we said was true. And you know of our concern for you from the way we lived when we were with you. So you received the message with joy from the Holy Spirit in spite of severe su suffering that it brought you. In this way, you imitated both us and the Lord. As a result, verse 7, as a result of how you lived, you became an example to all the believers in Greece throughout both Macedonia and Achaia. One little church, <laughs> like this little church, living like Christ living the way that the church should live, the hands and feet of Jesus, the body of Christ living in this world. And they were becoming an example to Greece. Not just to North Idaho, <laughs> but to Greece. That's much, much larger. I don't know if that equates to the whole state of Idaho. I'd have to look at my geography and figure it out. But we'll just say that that's the whole state of Idaho. They heard about a little town in Bonner's Ferry living like Jesus. Wow, what a statement. Paul goes on to write in that letter in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, But we don't need to write to you about the importance of loving each other, for God himself has taught you to love one another. <laughs> what more can a person do than lay down his life for their friends, is what Jesus said. And I've laid down my life for you, so go and do the same. Verse 10, Indeed, you are already showing your love for all the believers throughout Macedonia. Even so, dear brothers and sisters... We urge you to love them even more. Don't stop there. Don't stop with good job. Keep on so that the word of God will spread, so that Jesus Christ will return a second time triumphantly and claim his children, his bride. However you want to view that. We will spend eternity with the Lord where there is no more suffering, there is no death, there is no more disease, no more pain but forever with God Almighty, with Jesus. Wow. The author of Hebrews writes something similar. We don't know who that author is, but he writes the same things that Paul says in his letters about the fact that we're running a race, that there is a prize out there, that we don't need to give up. Paul, when he writes these things, is, com is comparing to an Olympic athlete, so to speak the elite, the most training that could possibly go into competing a game. And they compete for a little wreath at that time, a little flower wreath that they put on their head. What are we competing for? An eternal crown, eternal salvation. Praise from God Almighty saying, well done my good and faithful servant. <laughs> How much more should we be serious about competing about the prize that is ahead of us. So here's what the author in Hebrews wrote in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with endurance the race set out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endure, endured such hostility from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. If you can remember, Jesus says this too. He says it to the church in Laodicea. He says it to the church um, at, in Ephesus when he writes the letters in Revelation. Do you remember that first love? Do you remember when you first realized that God loved you so much that He gave His only Son to save you? Think of that. Dwell on that. Think of things above. Build up treasures in heaven rather than here on earth. It's not a sin to want and desire things, but desire heavenly things. God built that into you to desire things, but desire Him Desire the creator of all things, not creation. Desire to please him, not to live your own life. Paul addresses the Colossians this way in Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus, and from our brother Timothy. 
We are writing to God's holy people, or yours might say saints, in the city of Colossae, who are faithful brothers and sisters. That's the title of this message. In Christ. Don't forget those two words. You see, your faith needs to be bound in something. They're faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. Who He is, what He died for, what He taught, why He's coming again, the whole package. i got my Bible up here instead of my phone. All of God's Word written down as a love letter for you. May God our Father give you grace and peace. If you're not experiencing that, then maybe there's a reason why. Jesus died so that you could have grace, peace, joy, love. You, the Spirit was given to you so that these would be fruits of the Spirit. So that we could love even our enemies. Verse 3, we always pray for you. And we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all of God's people. Sounds a lot like the church in Thessalonians, doesn't it? Paul heard of two things. He'd never been there to visit this church. He didn't start this church. This church started because someone who heard him at a Paul crusade instead of a Billy Graham crusade, right? And went back and told his, his friends there and their church started. They understood for the first time that God loved them and their lives weren't their own and they lived that way. And their faith was growing and flourishing and their love for one another was growing and flourishing. We have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all of God's people. Exactly how we're supposed to live as a church. What do you think people are saying about this church? We got a good reputation in town, I can tell you that. I can tell you that from other people. I can tell you from, from pastors. You may know it, you may not. But, there's plenty, but, there's that but word, there's plenty of room for growth. That's why I read that from Thessalonians. We encourage you more and more and more. Well, that was like I said, everybody in the state of Idaho had heard about them. Everybody in the state of Idaho hasn't heard about us. Let's be honest. I wish that were true. But let's long to have that kind of faith where everybody in the Free Methodist Conference is talking about us. Outside of this denomination, they're talking about us. In the world, they're talking about us. What are they? is this church doing up in Bonner's Ferry? They're living like Jesus. Barnabas was so excited when, when he saw that, that he went and got Paul, and they were first called Christians at Antioch because they were living like Christ. And what happened from that? <laughs> Barnabas went out, I mean, Barnabas went out, yes, and kind of went to the background. We don't know what all happened to him. But Paul went out and not single-handedly spread the gospel message to the Gentile world because we see right here that Timothy, young Timothy, was beside of him. As we read, he gives thanks to others that are beside him. There are other people helping him along. But it, Paul, because of the excitement of people living like Christ, was brought by Barnabas and then went out to change the world. Wow. So Paul saw two things here. First one was being faithful. Faith. What does that mean? Faith means you have total trust and confidence in something, but in what? Well, it's clear. It said in Jesus Christ, right? So what is your faith and confidence in? Well, examine yourself and think about it. Because if your total faith and confidence was in, was in Him, then you wouldn't worry about finances. You wouldn't worry when disease is knocking at your door. You wouldn't worry when somebody has slandered your name. Oh my goodness, that's terrible. You wouldn't worry about the things that have come in the way that, that you didn't want, you want to go do this today, but, but your friend called you and they need you. You would know that your life is not your own if your faith was grounded and rooted in Jesus Christ. If your faith is grounded and rooted in anything else, then you're taking away from your faith in Jesus Christ. He said you can't serve two masters. You can't serve both Him and, maybe your version says, money. 
Because see, most time it does come down to that. It's things. You got our health in there, and we got our eye in there. The pride, oh yeah, that's a terrible thing. But when we think about why we don't do most things, it's because of something else. Because even when I'm in there, I wanted to go do this, whatever this was. So we've got the eye problem in there, but we also have the love for the things. And you can't serve both God and money. And notice serve is in there. Not another word, but we're to serve someone. And we either serve Jesus or we serve that other guy. Let's be honest. And that guy, the devil, has no power and no authority in your life if you have been sealed by the Spirit. None. Read Scripture. He has no power and authority in your life. And if there is a temptation or whatever, then there is a way that God has put in there for you to escape. God has done it all for you when Jesus Christ came and gave His life on that cross to save you. Is that what your faith is grounded into? Friday we watched a movie called Born Again. I couldn't even remember this morning when Bob said, well, you know, we wanted a copy of the movie. I don't understand that movie when it was made because, man, it's had as good a Christian message as any movie I've seen in a long time. But it must not have been designed for that reason because it had a ton of cussing in it that was bleeped out. <laughs> it was all bleeped out. You don't have to worry. But I'm thinking, here they are talking about Jesus and how, you know, a life dedicated to him and stuff. And then the next one, you hear all these bleeps coming out. And I'm thinking, what? I don't understand. When they first came out with the movie, there was only a few hundred copies. Then they brought it out later as like a 30th year anniversary and brought it out. But what a message that's there. And everybody thought that Chuck Colson was trying to avoid punishment. But instead, God got a hold of him and showed him his sins. And he was like David, and he said, Against you, Lord, and only you, if I've sinned, show me how to be different. Show me how to be changed, to live a life. And if you don't know, he, when he came out and the movie ended there with him starting prison ministry, and that prison ministry is huge today because him, inspired by God, and a few other people that walked beside of him, young Timothys, did that ministry. And it is still going today. It's a huge ministry. There are all kinds of different parts of it. Because one man said, my life is not my own. It's yours, God. But you're going to have to walk through this with me. You're going to have to show me. I can't do it on my own. And that's exactly what that movie was about. One of the people that influenced him was C.S. Lewis in his writing, Mere Christianity. So I thought about that today, and I thought I'd put a few C.S. Lewis quotes from Mere Christianity in here. Here's one talking about this being born again. Notice the movie wasn't called Saved, and I know it. It was called Born Again. Because born again implies, and Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he cannot see heaven, let alone enter into heaven. John chapter 3. Born again means that I have died to my old self. New creation has come. New life. Totally different from the way you lived before. Sure, those temptations are still there, but there's a way of escape. And the more that you lean on Christ the more you, through the power of the Spirit, try to become like Christ, who is God in the flesh, the more that these sinful temptations will kind of just disappear. It's what heaven's going to be like anyway, right? Why shouldn't we be longing and living for that goal? So here's what C.S. Lewis wrote. Give me all of you. I don't want so much of your time, so much of your talents and money, and so much of your work. I want you, all of you, I have not come to torment or frustrate the natural man or woman, but to kill it. No half measures will do. I don't want to only prune a branch here and a branch there. Rather, I want the whole tree out. Hand it over to me. The whole outfit, all of your desires, all of your wants, all of your wishes, and all of your dreams. Turn them all over to me. Give yourself to me and I will make you a new self in my image. Give me yourself and in exchange I will give you myself. My will shall become your will. 
My heart shall become your heart. Scripture tells us that He'll give us a new heart. God will do that. He is faithful and just. If He would send His Son to die for you, you can count on all of His promises. So what is your faith rooted and planted in? Is it firmly established in Jesus Christ? Unfortunately, many Christians profess to know Jesus, but yet their faithfulness doesn't show Jesus. Especially in the second thing that Paul saw, that their love for one another was there. That means there was no bickering, there was no backstabbing, there was no jealousy. There was a love for one another, if you went and read Acts, that they didn't even consider the things that they had, no matter how wealthy they were, they didn't consider them to be their own, but instead sold them so that others who had need would not have need anymore. And the Lord added to their numbers daily. That means He added the financial burden to them daily also. But if you keep reading, there was no needy people among them. And their numbers grew and grew and grew. Their number, numbers as disciples and followers of Christ. Not just, hey, professors, but people who lived like that. Changed lives. And the world was changed dramatically by a church, by a handful of disciples who said, my life is not my own. When the young rich ruler came to Jesus, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, keep the commandments. He says, I have. What else do I lack? Is there anything? And Jesus said, go sell all that you have and then come and follow me. The point's not about selling all that you have, but the point is about is your heart willing to give up everything to follow him? Because just like C.S. Lewis said, there's no in-between. Jesus demands being Lord of all. I mean, He gave up heaven and came to earth to die for you. Why would He not demand that? God's one and only Son, ridiculed, tormented, ble bleeding, and died alone on a cross to redeem us to new life. Jesus says this and this from the Sermon on the Mount. He tells us what a foundation in Him looks like. Therefore, Matthew 7, 24, 24 through 27. Therefore, everyone who hears the word, these words of mine and acts on them, hears and acts, two things, is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the torments raged, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because its foundation was on the rock. The rock is Christ. But, complete opposite, everyone again, who hears these words of mine and does not act on them, it's like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the torments raged, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell. And great was its collapse. Maybe your version says a little, something a little differently. It was complete, final, and utter destruction. There was no rebuilding that house. Everything was washed away and gone. No saving anything. What kind of house are you building? Is your foundation built on Jesus Christ and nothing less? Is Jesus Lord of everything? Here's another quote from Mere Christianity. Imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps, you can understand, understand what He's doing. He is getting the drains right, stopping the leaks in the roofs, and so on. You knew that those jobs needed doing, and, and so you're not surprised. But presently, He starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one that you thought of. Throwing out a new wing here and there, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage, but he's building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. That's what Jesus did for you on the cross. Is he built a place by sacrificing his life that God Almighty could come and reside in. Wow. 
Many people who heard that message that day thought they were okay in their salvation. They thought they were justified in the things that they did. Back up to the verses prior to that. Verses 21 to 23. We started in 24 a second ago. Here's what the words are of Jesus prior to that. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness, because their foundation wasn't built on Jesus Christ and nothing else. So I'll look a little further in the kind of faith that Jesus said that we should have. In Luke 14, verse 26, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. Jesus is telling me to hate others? I thought we were supposed to love others, even our enemies. So it can't mean that. And besides, it says right after that, to, to hate even my own life. So Jesus has got to be teaching here that love for Him has to be greater than love for anything else. Family's a good thing. Children are a good thing. Your wife is a good thing. Your husband is a good thing. A great thing. They're a blessing from God given to you before sin ever even came into this world. God instituted marriage and gave the ability to have children before sin ever came into this world. It's a pure thing but it shouldn't be greater than your love for Him. And you've got to throw that I part in there because it's got to be greater than the love for your own life because if a man loves his own life, he'll give up his life to save it. He'll deny himself, take up his cross, and follow after Jesus. Verse 28 says, Which of you wishing to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost to see if he has the resources to complete it? Otherwise, if he lays the foundation and is unable to finish the work, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, this man could not finish what he started to build. So the question I have for you is, what is this new life worth to you? What is eternal salvation worth to you? And have you calculated the cost of being a disciple of Jesus Christ? Did you just think you saved and you know it and that's it? Because the rest of the song says, and my life will surely show it, built on scriptural basis. I will give up my life to serve Him. I will love others. I will, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, that talks about what love is. Love is faithful, love is kind, love keeps no records of wrong. Oh, that's a big one. <laughs> I think I can do these other things, but I sure remember if somebody wronged me. But I shouldn't. I need to give it to Jesus. Because He sure kept no records of wrong. He would have never laid down His life for me if He had. In Luke 14, it goes on in verse 31 to say, gives us another example or another parable about counting that cost. What king on his way to war with another king will not first sit down and consider whether he can engage with 10,000 men, the one coming against him with 20,000? And if he is unable, he will send a delegation while the other king is still far off to ask for terms of peace. Now this one may sound a little more confusing to you, and you can dig into it with all your scholarly mind and wisdom, but let's just approach it with childlike faith. Jesus has told us what to do. Whoever does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. So he gives us two examples. The first one is, if you're building something, calculate the cost. Second one is, if you're going to war, if you're going to battle, do you have the resources? So if you want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, have you figured the cost first of all? And don't expect it not to be a war or a battle, guys. Jesus Christ suffered and died and looked out through Scripture one after another. And so did His disciples. So did those who followed after Jesus. So are all these letters. In spite of suffering, ridicule, pain, even fear of death, they followed faithfully after Jesus Christ because the reward that they had was worth it. They counted their lives worthless to know Jesus Christ. So just look at it with those simple, simple things. It is a war. 
And guess what? You have the cost applied because Jesus Christ put all the cost on the cross. He said, it is finished. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they can do. It might look like Satan, the enemy, has you outnumbered, but he does not. The battle has been won. There is victory in Jesus Christ. Verse 33, in the same way, now we're back to Jesus' point of these stories, in the same way, any one of you who does not give up everything that he has, he cannot be my disciple. The young rich ruler walked away that way because he wasn't willing to give it up for Jesus. It wasn't that he had a lot of money. It wasn't anything else. It was just he wasn't willing to make Jesus Christ Lord of all. I hope and pray that you are today. I hope you see what Jesus has said so that we live a life of worth, so that we can be a church who is faithfully grounded in Jesus Christ, so that our love is shown to one another, that we are talked about all over the world because that's the church that we're supposed to be. How much are you willing to pay to have life? This life. Would you give up the savings that you had to, to cure cancer? Would you do this or that to, to obtain whatever goal it is in your life? We work hard for our goals. Your goal is to be like Christ. And you don't have to do it on your own. You simply have to let the Holy Spirit live through you. Verse 33 of Luke 14 said, In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything cannot be my disciple. God did it for you with the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus isn't finished there, though. There's verse 34 and 35 here. Salt is good. What's it good for? For seasoning in this case. It's a preservative too, but seasoning is what it's talking about. Salt is good, but... If the salt loses its savor, that's why I know that it's seasoning. It adds to the taste of food. With what will it be seasoned? There's nothing else to be seasoned. We're supposed to be the salt of the earth, not something else. The rocks aren't supposed to cry out and season this world. We are the followers of Jesus Christ. So if salt is, is good and it loses its savor, how will it be seasoned? won't be. It is fit neither for the soil nor the manure pile. So it's thrown out. He who has ears, let him hear. Do you have savor in your life so that others are seeing Christ through you? Ah. Did Jesus know chemistry? <laughs> Salt can't lose its savor. Did you know that? Salt is one of the most stable compounds there is on the periodic table, whatever, however you want to relate this. I'm not a chemist, so you can you know, point fingers at me for some of my terms, but it's a stable compound. That means it doesn't break apart. It's made up of two volatile compounds, sodium and, chlor sodium and chlorine. Sodium chloride is what salt is. We make bombs out of those things. They're highly volatile. But you put them together and they're stable. Hmm. We're called to be salt. All the volatility in our life is gone. We're stable in the foundation of Jesus Christ. Amen. So that we can season this world. A stable element because we know that we have hope. That, that we are safe and secure in the arms of Jesus. Back to the Sermon on the Mount, because that's where I started. Matthew chapter 5, we went back a little bit in that sermon. Verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. These are Jesus' words. But if the salt loses its savor, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled on. Then he gives us a second thing here that we're like. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. That's just foolish. Instead, they place it on a lampstand and it gives light to everyone in the house. 
Notice that next, the next verse. In the same way, just like we had back in Luke. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and do what? Glorify your Father which is in heaven. The purpose of being like Christ is because Christ was God in human form. That means we're supposed to be like God because God lives in us and we let that light shine. Jesus said to become children of light. That is our calling and He's called us to do it collectively as a body because we can get more things done. Jesus even said that we would do mightier things, mightier miracles than He did while He was here in the flesh because there's more of us collectively if we live like Christ. If we don't, we might be like those cities that He said, Woe to you, and I would have performed miracles there if only you would have believed, if only you would have prayed, if only you would have lived by the power that is given you. So will you live that way? Will you be salt to this world? Will you be light to this world? I'll close with one more quote from C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity. A Christian society is not going to arrive unless most of us really want it. And we are not going to want it until we become fully Christian. I may repeat do as you would be done till I am black in the fact, but I cannot really carry it out till I love my neighbor as myself. And I can't learn to love my neighbor as myself till I learn to love God. And I cannot learn to love God except by learning to obey Him first. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for those who have chosen to follow you and we have their words written down, Paul's words written through you, C.S. Lewis's words. Father, we thank you that your word has t stood the test of time, that every word is true and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. May we apply your word to our lives. May we not look lightly on the fact that you live and reside inside of us and that you have called us to be a light to this world together, to love one another as Christ loved and gave himself for us. Father, may we make a difference in this world. Fill your spirit in this place today. If there are any barriers that need to be set down at the cross, Lord, we know that the cross has the final word. Lord, I pray that, that by your spirit, each and every one of us lay down those obstacles to grace. I thank you and praise you for your love and for the lavish grace that you've poured out upon your children. We thank you for this letter to the Colossians and the one to the, to the Thessalonians as well, Father. We just thank you and praise you for all the things that you do. We thank you for the blood of Jesus that redeems us and makes us whole. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.